Father, we do stand on the rock of our salvation, who is Christ. We do honor you, we praise you, we thank you for your mercies, for your faithfulness, for you are indeed unchangeable. And in your promise, in your covenant promise, your love, your kindness, your mercy, your favor to us will not change because of Christ. We bless you for him. We pray that you may be glorified and honored wherever your name is being preached in this your day, wherever your people are gathering to worship you, to hear your word. Father, send blessings upon your word. Send salvation as our pastor Zidon prayed. Be honored and exalted. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. It is good to see you, brethren, after a couple of weeks away. One, because a plane left me behind. The other one, because I was asked to preach at another church in town. And after preaching in that church one sermon, I may, that may become two or three here for Cornerstone, because the topic I was asked to preach in that church was the subject of being reformed, or deformed. From that, which I condensed in 45 minutes, I want to perhaps preach one or two sermons on the subject of what is being reformed. What is a reformed church? And uh, I have some verses that I would just like to read or mention to you as we engage in this topic. One of them is the famous Romans 5.1, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The other one is 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 18, where Paul tells the Greeks in Corinth, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in wisdom of words, so that the cross of Christ may not be made void or vain, for the word of the cross is foolishness, to those who perish, but to those who are being saved, that is to us, it is the power of God. The next text I want to read is 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, very close to the one just mentioned. Paul tells the Corinthians his heart. He says, when I came to you, he says, I came in fear and trembling, but I did not come to you in wisdom to preach the testimony of God, for I did not come with excellency of words or wisdom, for I determined to know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. Ephesians 3.21, after unfolding the purposes of God from eternity in the gospel, in redemption in Christ, before entering into that practical section of Ephesians 4, Paul tells the Ephesians to Him, speaking about God, to him be the glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, for ages and ages, forever and ever. And finally, 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 13, as Timothy is set in Ephesus to put things in order, Paul says to him, Timothy, while I arrive, while I go, I want you to get busy, to occupy yourself with these things with a reading, with a public reading, that is a verb, with a public reading of the scriptures, with exhortation, and with instruction. And I chose those five texts because they, in a sense, condense and encapsulate what is a Reformed church. <laughs> On October 31st, 1517, that is about 506 years ago, an Augustinian monk who was a lawyer but also a theologian nailed, according to the legend, at the door of the church at Wittenberg Castle, 95 Theses. Now, that is nowadays being challenged as a myth, as a legend, that there was no nailing of any thesis, that it was actually a letter sent. But whether it is a legend or it is not, in those 95 theses, this monk 
sought to bring to discussion, bring to public interchange of ideas and debate 95 theses on things that he stated the church was not doing according to the scriptures. Three things colluded in that event because that is marked as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Now, we have these ideas that the Protestant Reformation was this thing sent down from heaven in a very mystical way, and this revival came to earth, and Christianity sort of started. No, no, no. Christianity had been running <laughs> since Adam, since the Garden of Eden. Now, on that event, or that occasion, colluded three things. One was a technological advance that changed humanity, the printing press invention. Gutenberg's invention allowed the public copying and reproduction and obvious dissemination of anything, books, pamphlets, booklets, whatever, could be quickly transmitted, reproduced, translated, disseminated throughout the world. So that was a big event that happened or had happened already. There was political issues with the Germans and Rome. And the Germans were having issues with the Pope, papal authority and with the Holy Roman Empire of the day, etc. And there was a wicked king, I should say, Henry VIII, who wanted to divorce his wife, Catherine, to marry Anne Boleyn. And those three things sort of colluded and God used to promote this reformation, this revolution, this issue that brought scriptures to the people, the translation of the scriptures, and the teaching of Bible to people outside of the already established religion and system where Christianity had been contained but which gradually had corrupted over the years. So political rivalries, the printing press, the perversion of a king catalyzed, galvanized, and catapulted the Protestant Reformation. So what is a reformed Christian? What is a reformed church? We could say several things about it, but I will start today with this point. It is a church that has been committed, or it is a person that is committed to the solas, or what has been called the solas of the Reformation. They are listed there on the screen, sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, solus Christus, Solideo Gloria. And I will try to cover at least three of those this morning. And I would like to read something written by Ryan McGraw because there is some misunderstanding regarding these five solas, in my opinion. Ryan McGraw writes, Neither Martin Luther nor John Calvin nor any other Protestant reformer summarized their teachings in an orderly list that included the five solas. It was in the 19th and 20th centuries that this Kentopol summary became the abbreviated version of what is known as Reformed theology. So let's be clear that the five solas are not something that Luther wrote on those 95 theses, or that he later wrote about in some book, or perhaps Zwingli, or somebody else, or Beza, no, or Calvin. No, this, this is something that over the passing of time was kind of distilled and condensed as these were five issues that the Protestant Reformation brought to the table and consequently were brought to the common people as the teaching of the Bible. And the first one of those five solas is sola scriptura. I think it's easy to devise where it comes from only the scriptures. And what does that mean? I'll quote loosely Paul Washer now. 
Paul Washer, and I'm quoting him loosely because I got this from one of his sermons. Many understand the Reformation in terms of the five solas and five point doctrines of grace or the five point of Calvinism. But having a Calvinistic theology does not make us reformed. To be a son or daughter of the Reformation is to bind oneself to the scriptures, to limit oneself to them, and to try to apply all that is written in the scriptures to our life and ministry. I believe that is a key element that we have to understand. Because there's a lot of would-be theologians that assume they are reformed because they read a booklet explaining either the five solas or the five points of Calvinism, and immediately they say, we're reformed. And then they go into their pulpits and they say, our church is reformed. But when you really deal with them, uh, I'm not so sure if you really get the point of what it is to be reformed. It is more than embracing intellectually or acknowledging certain theological tenets. Now, when we deal with sola scriptura, what are we saying? What are the, what this distillation of what the reformers were trying to say, meaning? Well, they are saying that the faith was once and for all delivered to the saints. That's what Jude 1 says. The letter of Jude, and there is debate as to when was it written, but I side with those who say it was written at the end of the first century, whether it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD or after, we do not know, but it was one of the latest documents of the New Testament canon. And this Jude who writes is the brother of James, and both of them were siblings of the Lord Jesus. So when he, this man writes, he says, I wanted to write to you about our common faith, a faith that has been once and for all delivered to the saints. We shouldn't be dogmatic about using that verse as the only proof of it. But at that point in the history of the New Testament and of the church, this man says the faith we embrace has already once and for all been delivered. Meaning, there's no new revelation. There's no new God told me that this is what we ought to do from now on. The revelation of God, the things that pertain to life and godliness, have already been delivered to us, and in the language of Paul in Ephesians 2.20, has been delivered to us by apostles and by teachers, and they have laid the foundation of what we believe. And to the Corinthians, he says, that foundation which is Christ, and his revelation to apostles and prophets cannot be changed or thwarted or somehow added to. I know the text is used wrongly and in, in perhaps forcing an argument, but still Revelation says at the end, beware of the person who adds to the words of this prophecy. And Deuteronomy also says, beware to the person who adds to the word of this law. What God commands, what God ordains, what God has revealed is already sealed and completed and doesn't need any addition. Prophet Isaiah told the false prophets of his day, go to the law and go to the testimony. If you don't speak according to the law and to the testimony of God, you're speaking in darkness. There's no dawn in you. Well, but, but, I, but I feel in my heart that I don't care what you feel in your heart. You speak according to the law and to the testimony. That is the point of sola scriptura. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture. And now we have to admit Paul is talking about the Old Testament. The Ketuvim and the Navim and the Torah that formed the Jewish Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament. All scripture is inspired by God. And the word is Theopnestus, breathed out by God. And it is profitable for teaching, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man, the woman of God, may be entirely prepared and equipped for every good work. With what? With Scripture. Second Peter 3.1, Peter says, 
the prophets who spoke from before the word of God. They spoke not of their own accord, but they spoke carried by the Holy Spirit. The verb pheromenoi. You've heard the word ph pheromones, however you pronounce that. These, these substances that are carried through the air by animals and, and they can affect the behavior or send signals to other animals in their pack or others. Well, that's the idea. These men spoke carried by the Holy Spirit to record and to say the word of God. Not their own words, not their own ideas or inventions. Psalm 19 speaks of this word and calls it the law. And yes, at that point when that psalm was written, we didn't have everything we have today in the canon, but it still says the law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. The law of the Lord is sufficient to provide wisdom to the simple, to provide righteous judgment. All of those commandments are fair, are just, and there is wisdom in them. And this is what some call the sufficiency of Scripture. A term, by the way, that is old. It's not from the Reformation. Augustine and Chrysostom used that term to describe, and, the, and, and it was used in the 4th century. So it was used 1,200 years before the Reformation. But to describe that what we need for life and godliness is sufficient Sufficiently declared, explained, taught, commanded, exemplified in the scriptures. And they wrote, self, scripture is self-authenticating. It is clear to the rational reader. It is its own interpreter and sufficient of itself to be the final authority of Christian doctrine. This is what many Statements of faith call all the scriptures, these are, are the standards of our rule and of our practice. It comes from that element of the scriptures are sufficient and complete to be that standard. Now, we have to, of course, dissect what does sola scriptura does not mean because it has been taken to extremes. It doesn't mean that sola scriptura has the answer to everything. If you're taking algebra in high school now or in advanced math in college, no, you will not solve quadratic equations with the scriptures. You can't. You have to study your book and do all the exercises in the book to learn the technique of how to solve them. So no, scripture is not the answer to everything. If you're fixing your car, don't go to the Bible to find exactly what bowl to tighten or what thing to change. You have to go to the computer and see where the problem is at and then change it, right? Sufficient for those things that pertain to life and to godliness. Sola Scriptura does not mean bibliolatry either. What is bibliolatry? This. We're going to set a standard in the church. We're going to open the Bible. We're going to put it there for all to see. That's the Word of God. That is a translation of a copy of the document that somebody wrote, and we believe that in its original autographs, is indeed the Word of God. But I have to side <laughs> with a theologian that many mistake and misjudge for being a heretic, and I don't think he was. I don't agree with everything, everything he said. But Karl Barth said, to be the Word of God, it has to interact with you. I don't even know where it, it, it is open right now. That's the Word of God. No, to be the Word of God, I have to open it and read it and find out that it's Proverbs 9. And as I read Proverbs 9, then... God starts talking to me through his word. So sola scriptura is not bibliolatry where we treat the text as if the text is divine. The word of God is the word of God, but the one who's divine is the author and the giver of that word. And we have to be careful because many errors in fundamentalism have stemmed 
from that wrong perception of wrong treatment of Scripture. Scripture means nothing if I don't read it, if I don't teach it, if I don't translate it, if I don't explain it, if I don't interact with it, if I don't ask the Holy Spirit to illumine my mind, if I don't pray to the Lord, show me what it says here and make me live according to your word. I hope that was clear, clear and, and, and you didn't get any heresy out of it. And sola scriptura does not mean that we do not follow any traditions. Oh, we are Bible people. There's no traditions in our church. Think that well. Because we follow a lot of traditions that are not in Scripture. What is a tradition? Interesting that Paul told the Thessalonians in 2 Corinthians 2.15 that they had to stand, to stand firm on the traditions they had learned from him. And to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11.2, he wrote, Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. <laughs> because not everything we do is spelled out in Scripture. Not even everything related to church life. Have you noticed that in Acts 20, 35, Paul used a text or a word from Jesus that we quote a lot? It is more blessed to give than to receive. What is the happiest time of the month or should be when we write or zeal our offerings to the church? Or when we write a check or zeal our offerings to benevolence or our gifts to those in need or whatever we do for the poor or for our family members or for whatever? That should be the happiest money transfer we make. Why? Paul says, because Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. In what gospel is that written? Nowhere. No text in the gospels say that. But Paul said that to the Ephesians. That Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. John, at the end of his gospel, writes, there were many things that Jesus did that if we would write them, there's no room in the world to put the books contained in them. There's a lot of things that the New Testament has which came down to us via tradition, apostolic tradition, and that is the secret. In the scriptures, we have everything that we need for life and godliness. And by that, we're not endorsing the way the Roman Catholic Church uses traditions as binding and as equal to the Word of God. No. What we're saying is we all follow traditions. I was in a church last week that they sang like four hymns and they didn't have any instruments. They just have uh, music, background music. And then I've, I, I go to a church I love a lot in the DR and they sing like six or seven hymns. And here we only sing two at the beginning and one at the end. So why? <laughs> because we have liberty to do that. Because there's nothing in Scripture that says how many hymns we are to sing and in what order. And, and, and Pastor Daron came and read the announcements at the beginning and read, well, I've seen churches that they sing like three or four hymns, let everybody come in, and in the middle they give the announcements and the reading and the praying so that everybody may hear them and, and they accommodate for the late comers. Because there's nothing in Scripture that says, let's do it before, or let's do it in the middle, or let's do it after. I've even seen churches that they do it after the service. Nothing regulates what we do. What we should do is to make sure that our traditions, whatever they are, do not lead us away from Scripture, but bring us closer to Scripture. I was talking to, to Otto Sanchez the other day, because they had another baptism, and, and so far this year, they've baptized 60 people in the church. And he says, do you receive them as members when you baptize them? And he says, no, we baptize them. And then those who want to become part of the church, they have to take the membership class. So that's interesting because in my tradition, baptism and church membership come together. Yeah. And we were talking about the book of Acts because those who were baptized were added to their number. Yeah, but the Ethiopian eunuch 
was baptized, the Lord took Philip away and he was sent to Ethiopia and who knows what happened with him. History and tradition says that he arrived and preached and the church was formed. But Philip didn't make him any member of any church. Point being, we can use the book of Acts as we wish to accommodate our practice. But the book of Acts have both versions. Now, if you baptize two, three people a year, it's easy to say, be baptized and become a member and we put all together. If you do it with 60, it's more challenging. Because the challenges of being taught how to become a member of a church may require longer time than the time required for a disciple who wants to be baptized because he believed to be baptized. It's just a matter of traditions. Are they closer or farther from Scripture? I just want to challenge you to realize that what you see doing your churches is not thus says the Lord, as many believe. In fact, our own confession of faith, the 1689 Confession says, and I'm quoting the confession, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation or the, of the Spirit or traditions of men. But then they write, Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as revealed in the Word. And that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and the government of the church common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word which are always to be observed. So even our own confession says the time we meet, the hymns we sing, how we arrange the church, how we do things, how, we, how the church is governed. No, it is not spelled out in Scripture. Common sense, the light of nature, hopefully following the wisdom of Scripture, will address many of those things. Commitment to the Scriptures is what sola scriptura mean, means. Commitment to its redemptive and theological context not as a dictionary. Secondly, sola fide, and the next ones will be faster. Man is justified by faith without the works of the law. That's what the Bible says, clearly spelled out. It is called by theologians forensic justification. Why forensic? Because it is a declaration of acquittal. Justification is God declaring righteous the one who is not righteous by faith alone. The judicial system in the U.S. has this element. If you have watched movies or have been in trials yourself as a juror, you have seen that the indicted is declared guilty or non guilty. Why are they not declared innocent or called innocent? Because in the judicial system, you are presumed to be innocent, and it is the job of the district attorney to prove your culpability before a jury, and then the jury says, yes, they proved you're gu guilty or no. You know what? You continue being presumed innocent. There's a lot of guilty people that have walked free. A lot of people who committed crimes because of a skillful defense walked away and were declared non-guilty. Now take that to the gospel. Paul says, how can a just judge like God declare or consider the guilty as innocent? Because he does by imputing the righteousness of another by taking the obedience of Christ who lived perfectly without spot, wrinkle, deceit, or any sin, putting it in the account of the guilty, and by taking the guiltiness of all of us and putting that in the account of Jesus and having him pay for it. 
That's what it's called double imputation. And it's not an invention. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 21. He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf so that we who are sinners may become the righteousness of God in him. That's exactly what the gospel is. And that's exactly what sola fide emphasizes. And it is by faith, and by faith alone. Why? Because Rome teaches justification by faith and works. But Paul clearly says, man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And later on he says, and it is, if it is grace, it is not works. Otherwise, grace would have not been grace. And that leads us to the next point of what is being reformed, or what is a reformed church, sola gratia. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Tony read it, and we didn't talk about this, but Tony read it correctly. Because in our evangelism classes, we are taught to say, oh, remind people that by grace you are saved. And this is a gift of God, not of ourselves, so that no one should boast. And we stop there. Wrong. There's a verse 10. For we have been created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. But the point is, we are saved only by grace. And if it is grace, Paul clearly, explicitly spells out, if it is grace, works are not included. Now, if it is grace, Titus 1.8 says, He saved us. Again, clearly spelled out. Not by works of righteousness that we might have done, but according to his grace, in the washing of the blood of Christ, in the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. How? By grace. And notice the verb tense. Paul says he saved us. Past tense. He doesn't say he will save us. He saved. It is a fait accompli. It is a done deal. Salvation happened for those who believe. They are saved. Even though in 1 Corinthians 2 he says for those of us who are being saved because our redemption is not complete. We are still in a fallen world and in a fallen flesh. But we have been saved already. And it is absolutely the work of God. Vody Bochum says the gospel is this. Believe there's no obedience involved. You are saved. Without obedience. And people get panicked about that. What are you saying? Are you a hyper grace person? Are you signing up with Tali and Chivichan and all those guys? No, I'm signing up with the Bible. You are saved by grace. And the gospel of salvation, it is faith alone that saves by grace alone, without obedience. Oh, and, and where's the obedience? Oh, that's a byproduct. That's a byproduct of being saved. But I don't, I don't worry about obedience. If I have to be discussing obedience with a believer, perhaps he's not a believer or she's not a believer. Obedience is not a condition of the gospel. Obedience is the byproduct of having been saved. You were called, chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God. For what? To obey. <laughs> That's the purpose of being chosen. Yes, God chooses us sovereignly that we obey. That's the name of the game. Obedience is the result, not the cause. You're saved by grace, and this is not of yourselves. It is not by works so that no one should boast, but you are the workmanship of God, created for good works, that you may walk in them.
That's it. This is not that complicated. And of course, solus Christus. Only Christ. Now, let me tell you a disappointment I have. You see all those signs of the five solas of the Reformation. Observe them. What is in the center? The Bible. And then the others to the side. No, Christ should be at the center, not the Bible. Oh, really? Yes, really. Because the Bible is about Christ. He is the subject of the Scriptures. He is the one of whom the Bible speaks about. He is the content of God's redemptive purpose. And all of the redemptive plan has one purpose, to unite all things around Christ. That's what Ephesians 1 says. So yes, Christ should be at the center. Christ alone is the way. Christ alone is the truth. Christ alone is the life. And no one comes to the Father but through Him. He said it explicitly. He said, I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the way to life. Nobody can have life but through me. And Jesus was insisting on that. The ones who came before me were robbers and thieves. I am the true door to God's fold for the sheep to come. Luke writes that in the preaching of Peter and John, they said, there is no other name under heaven given to men through which we can be saved. Let me say something that breaks my heart, and I don't get it completely, but I'll say it. Somebody asked MacArthur the other day, uh, what about all these people who are faithful in their religions? Are they going to hell? And MacArthur in his typical faith said, yes, the only way to salvation is Christ. And you know what I say? Amen. The only, if the Bible is true, I believe it is true. If the Bible is the Word of God, I believe it is the Word of God. From a biblical theological framework, there is no other name given among men under which we must be saved. Now, that is the name of Christ. That is not the name of those who are from the London Baptist Confession and of those who are Reformed and of those who are Evangelicals and of those who are this, 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 and that and who understand theology this, this, and that way. I do not know exactly how that works. Revelation 5 speaks of this multitude that no one can count. Myriads of myriads. If it would have been written in our days, it would have said millions of millions. In other words, billions. And I don't know how that works. I have to say, <laughs> there is a point where I stop. It is on, in Christ alone that we are saved. That doesn't mean that it is in Christ alone as we understand it theologically. But it is through Christ. And that day when the billions that cannot be counted are in heaven worshiping the Lamb, they will arrive there not on the basis of being faithful to their religion, but on the basis of Christ's name, the only name under which we can be saved. That's as much as I can say about it. Paul said, and this leads to the solus Christus, of course. That's what I'm talking about, only Christ. Paul says in Galatians 2.21, I do not reject the grace of God. Because if righteousness would come through our keeping of the law, then Christ died in vain. That is, that is very inclusive language. If somebody can attain righteousness by being faithful to their conscience, by being faithful to their belief system, by somehow expressing the righteousness of God in their conduct, not me. Paul says, then Christ died in vain. That's the topic of Professor Murray's little book on the, the atonement, redemption, accomplished and applied. Is there any other way that people can be saved? Could God devise any other method to save sinners other than the cross? No. It's the only way to be saved. If there's no cross, there's no hope, there's no salvation. 
And I stop here. I should have gone to Soli Deo Gloria, but my time is over. I just want to say three things as by way of conclusion. Does believing the five solas make us better than others? To my knowledge, we're not in any competition. This is not an issue of being better or worse. Oh, my church is a five solas church. Therefore, we have the best church in Miami. Now, there are many other churches who believe it, and we're not competing with any other churches. Matter of fact, we should be fishing in the ocean, not in fishing ponds. Recycling Christians is not evangelism. Recycling Christians from other churches who are unhappy is not <laughs> going out and making disciples from the nations. That is just recycling people. Back in the day, Christians would do campaigns, Billy Graham style, to save sinners. Now we do conferences to bring Christians who are unhappy with their churches because they heard our great speakers in the conference. That's not evangelism. So let's be clear. It's not a competition. Just a word of advice or counsel, if you want, or exhortation. Planning on moving? People ask me, are you guys going to move? No, we're not, gonna, we're not planning on moving. Miami is home for us. Cornerstone is home for us. We're not planning on moving because my children are moving themselves. So I cannot be chasing my children because the day they decide to move, what am I going to do? Move again? So no, I, I visit them. I'll be visiting them a lot if, if the Lord allows me. But if you're planning to move, let me just give you a word of exhortation. Or even if you're not planning, when the time to move comes, you, you are young people. One day an opportunity will come elsewhere and you'll have to move or may want to move. Don't leave finding a solid church for last. Don't, don't let the finding of a solid church, oops, oh, we're now here in Alaska. Oh, let's see where we find a church in Alaska. Find out before going to Alaska if you're going to find a place that is committed to the truths we hold dearly to. I'm not saying they have to be Reformed Baptists. I'm not saying they have to have the London 1689 Confession. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying value churches that stand for the truth. And remember, being Reformed it's not just affirming a couple of tenets about theology. Being reformed is being permeated, driven, colored, infused by scriptures. So your thinking automatically and your acting and your worldview more and more becomes fashioned by the truth of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Father, please help us <laughs> to be faithful to your word. Please help, please help us to be proclaimers of your gospel, of grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Please help us to be molded by the truth as it is contained in Christ, revealed by apostles and prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Please have mercy on us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.